Good morning. Good morning. Merry Christmas once again, and uh, I will be with you next weekend, uh, next Sunday, so Happy New Year to all of you as well as you celebrate this week. Uh, it is Amanda's birthday today. I think we should sing Happy Birthday to Amanda, huh? Happy, happy Birthday. chapter 2. Since we've been reading through chapter 1, I thought it would be good to read through chapter 2 since that's part of the story and we won't get it all uh, in the next few weeks here. We jump around and uh, John is going to be next week. You'll hear that text again. But please take note as you hear the different uh, stories for what's in some texts and not in others, in one gospel or the other, and there'll be a quiz after. No. Uh, so just but listen for the differences of what you hear. Uh, and so you'll hear Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, it, uh, or excuse me, Matthew, Luke, Matthew, and John. No Mark, because there is no birth story in Mark. So, um, uh, so just listen for the differences, and maybe I'll take note of that later. And then there's going to be seven op different opportunities for you to pick hymns, uh, pick carols to sing. Um, so we won't sing all the verses of all of them necessarily. I kind of went through and looked at most of them and said which ones might be good to do. But uh, we will uh, allow you to pick some of the uh, Christmas carols uh, at different points. And I'll stand up and we'll do that. And then we'll uh, sing those and then hear the text. I've got a short message uh, near the end, and then we'll finish up with our prayer. So uh, if you want to just kind of, as you're, uh, I don't know if you want to take a moment here just to peruse for a second um, uh, some of those favorite carols. Otherwise, uh, you probably know most of them. They, they run from 268 in your songbook to up to 300 are the Christmas carols. There's three that we're already going to do, O Come All You Faithful, and um, Go Tell It on the Mountain, and then I'm, my preaching text is actually going to be Old Little Town of Bethlehem, so you can't pick those three. Uh, and, but everything else is pretty much fair game. Some are more familiar than others, and I think we should be able to find uh, seven others that work there. So. All right, I think that's all the announcements I have, are there any other announcements or prayer concerns? It's great to have uh, people back on Friday evening for Christmas Eve to see some faces we haven't seen for a while. And uh, uh, hopefully in the new year here we'll be able to do that. But uh, unfortunately the reality of COVID is striking its head again. So I encourage you all to be safe and uh, take care in the midst of all of that. So thank you for your faithfulness and uh, being vaccinated and getting wearing your max. Yeah, it's much appreciated. I'm trying to stall to give you time to look your little bit. <laughs> but let's stand and join in our Christmas dialogue <clears throat> on page one of your bulletin. <laughs> Jesus, the bright morning star, shines light in the world. Okay, night, he shines for all to see. Jesus was born in the midst of injustice and poverty, that the world may see the justice and richness of God. God so loved the world that God sent Jesus, so that all who believe in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the light of our lives. Sing to God a new song. The song of hope, joy, and peace around the world. The Lord be with you. And also with you. 
Let us pray. All powerful and unseen God, the coming of your light into our world has brightened weary hearts with peace. Call us out of darkness and empower us to proclaim the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let's uh, join together in singing the first three verses of O Come All Ye Faithful, 283. First reading is from Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 20. In those days the decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration that was taken by Quirinius, the governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for him to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, for there was no place for them in the end. Word of God. Word of life. Thank you. Thanks be to God. God. All right, first choice. Yes. Mary, did you know? Uh, I don't think we have access to that, so we're going to 
Keep to the hymnal here. I, I know we don't have the words for all of them. Sorry about that. 296. 296. I would love to be able to do some of those others. 296. What child is this? Uh, let's do all three verses of that one. 296. What child is this? All three verses. <laughs>
Another selection. 271. 271, that's what we have there. And you have to sing it in Swedish. You have to sing it in Swedish? Yeah, I'm so glad. Let's try it in English. That'll be tough enough for us. Uh, it's short. Let's do all five verses. <clears throat> 271, I am so glad each Christmas Eve, all five verses. Just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Jesus awoke from sleep, or when Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son and named him Jesus. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The first Noel, let's do the odd verses, one, three, and five here. One, three, and five of 300, the first Noel.
The fourth reading is from Matthew, the second chapter, 1 through 11. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is a shepherd, who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out. And there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at his rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Go ahead, Arnie. Uh, 301. 301, okay. I was just going to say, if you want to go into the 301 and 2, uh, because especially after that story that fits, fits with those. Um, let's see. There's lots of verses there. <laughs> um, 1, 3, and 5. Yeah, let's do 1, 3, and 5 again. All right? 301, 1, 3, and 5. We're kind of odd this morning. <laughs>
the beginning was a word. The word was with God. And the word was God. He was the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. And with him, without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life. The life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. Word of God, Word of life. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Two ninety four in the bleak midwinter. I'm not sure what's appropriate for this one or two. Uh, but we're gonna do one and three. Okay. One and three then. Four or two ninety four in the bleak midwinter versus one and three. Lesson 6, Luke 2, verse 21 through 35. After eight days had passed, it was time to circumcise the child, and he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. 
Every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, <clears throat> Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, According to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and the sword will pierce your own soul too. Word of God, Word of Life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. A couple more options left that are open to you here. Any other favorites? Yeah. Jingle bells. Jingle bells. <laughs> I, I don't, I, we don't have music for, for those, so unfortunately, I suppose we could. I apologize on <laughs> good, good idea. Let's try another one. Can I take one? Yes. Sixty-nine, one and three. We can. One and three on two sixty-nine. Once in Royal David's city. One and we said one and three, right? Yeah. Very good. second chapter, verses 36 through 40. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow, 
to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to whom all were looking for the redemption of Israel. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their hometown of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Okay, before I, uh, we sing, we're going to sing uh, hymn 279, a little kind of Bethlehem here in a, in a minute. But uh, before that, just a couple of things. First of all, uh, in the readings, just a, uh, not a quiz, but just anything you notice between the three different Gospels uh, that was new to you or interesting to you? Well, I thought, uh, which one more? There's a little more depth in depth. Look at uh, Joseph, uh, and in fact, he was going to discard Mary. In, in Matthew, is all about Joseph. The focus is on Joseph, right? Luke, it's more on Mary, really, in some ways, especially with the prelude to the stories that we had. They were all about women, Elizabeth and Mary, in chapter one, right? And then chapter two, we hear about them going, but it's more about Mary giving birth. Joseph is in Matthew. Why is that so? Because Joseph is the one, I mean, because the, it's, well, it's the male part, sorry about that, but I mean, he's been, Jesus is being lifted up as the new David in Matthew. He's the new king, is, the, is what they're really talking about. And so to highlight that he comes from the line of Joseph, which isn't really the case if you go by Luke's gospel, where you got the virgin birth, right? You're not really told, you're told a little bit about that. But the whole, I mean, Joseph, and that connects then with the Old Testament, Joseph, who has these dreams, right, in the Old Testament. And Joseph has all these dreams uh, in this text as well. Did you notice that Luke has shepherds and Matthew doesn't? And Matthew has wise men and Luke doesn't? So our Christmas stories kind of go like this. Our, our Christmas pageants go like this, don't they? We put all of them together. I already said earlier, Mark doesn't have a, uh, a narrative for the birth story, and and John, that with John, you re you heard Arnie read that. That that's the birth story, but it has nothing about a birth, right? <laughs> it's all about the light coming in, God coming in, uh, and dwelling with us. Uh, Emmanuel only shows up in. The word Emmanuel, the name Emmanuel only shows up in Matthew, not Luke. So there's a lot of differences between uh, all of those. All right, I, I won't hang on to that, but we, over the last few weeks, have we've sung a lot of songs, and we've heard a number of songs in the scripture passages that we've been uh, reading. Uh, we heard from Zechariah, his song, uh, and we heard the Benedictus, and we heard uh, Mary's Magnificat, right? The, uh, Ma Mary, the mother of Jesus, her exclaiming all that was happening to her. Today we heard a third song uh, from Luke's Gospel. It is uh, one sung by Simeon, who appears to be an elderly guy because he's been waiting in the temple uh, to die, basically, right? Until he sees the Messiah's birth. Uh, and that com comes in that Gospel when Mary and Joseph bring Jesus to the temple to be circumcised on the eighth day, according to Levitical law. And there Simeon sings this song. Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace. According to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. This song is called the Noctumenus. Uh, in Latin, that means uh, for now dismissing. So it's that first part of that line. Uh, it's actually part of our liturgy, our communion liturgy. We don't sing that. Uh, if you look at uh, the first couple of settings after communion, uh, after um, communion is sometimes sung there. Also, that uh, hymn is sung uh, during the uh, evening service of Compline. 
Uh, it's in our in our worship books. We don't we don't do that service very often, and we don't sing this song. But it's there. It's a portion of scripture that is used in our liturgy. Here again in this song, we hear about peace. We hear about light that God is bringing, not just to us, but to all people, uh, in this Christ child who has come to dwell with us and to bring us salvation. So that's one song that we're looking at today. Today, as I said, I, I, uh, someone, had, one of my colleagues, we met a couple weeks ago, and they were, we were all asking, what are you going to do for Christmas Eve? Because, you know, it's like, it's the same story every year. So, I mean, how do you come up with something new and uh, exciting? And he suggested that he had preached on a little town of Bethlehem. And I thought, oh, that sounds kind of interesting. But I just couldn't work it into a Christmas Eve service, so I thought we use it today. So I'm going to um, have a sing that in just a second. And so what I want you to do is listen uh, as we sing that and hear some of the images that we've heard over this past season. Um, and there's, uh, uh, but first, before we sing it, I want to share a little bit of a uh, kind of a, an a, a indication of why this was written. Uh, background of why it was written and how where it came in. Um, so the background is that Philip Brooks uh, in the 18 uh, uh, about 60s, 60s to 70s in there, he was a very young uh, preacher. Uh, he was uh, a dynamic and inspirational speaker to the point uh, uh, that he got appointed to Holy Trinity Church in Philadelphia at a very young age, a large church. Um, and in, as he was then building his staff, he hired uh, a man named Louis Redner, who uh, he hired him to be not only the organist of the church, but also the uh, uh, Sunday school superintendent. So Tony, you got an extra job, you're coming up. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, but they, uh, as they came together, their church exploded in numbers uh, as they, uh, especially with the children. It says that they started out with 30 kids in their Sunday school, and within a year, uh, they had over 1,000 children coming to Sunday school. At least that's what the story says. Uh, and the numbers continued to increase with uh, Brooks's dynamic preaching and Redner's amazing music. But then the Civil War hit, uh, and there was a mood that then dramatically changed throughout uh, the community, obviously, and uh, it affected the church as well. The nation's spirits were dying, and I mean, women were coming to church in black because their husbands and sons had been killed in the war, and it just, everything just kind of, darkness fell over everything, it seemed, uh, and it, it creeped into the worship time as well. And as much as Brooks tried to be inspirational and encouraging to his congregation, it just drained him. And he was really feeling that sense of being burned out. Uh, and when the war eventually ended, he had this optimism that things would return to normal, that they uh, would have new, renewed vitality and joy would be restored. But it just didn't happen. I mean, there was a lot of residual effects because of the war. And then Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. And even though Brooks wasn't uh, the president's pastor, he was chosen because he was a, such a great orator, he was chosen to speak, uh, to do the sermon uh, at the president's funeral. And so he reached deep down and found the appropriate words to say for the moment, but that just gutted him more. It just burned him out even worse. And so he asked for a sabbatical from his congregation. They gave it to him and he traveled to the Holy Land. And as the story goes, on Christmas Eve he grabbed a horse now again, this is in the late 1800s, grabbed a horse and started riding off. And he rode off towards Bethlehem, which is about five, five miles away from Jerusalem. Uh, and he started heading out there, and at dusk, just as the first stars were starting to shine, uh, he came near to the city of Bethlehem. And Brooks', Brooks spirit was just lifted up as he got nearer and nearer to that spot where Jesus apparently was born. And he heard singing uh, coming from the city, uh, the place he was there at the Church of the Nativity, and uh, he could just feel the presence of God in that place. He later wrote, I remember standing in the old church in Bethlehem, close to the spot where Jesus was born. I listened hour after hour as a chorus of people sang hymns of praise to God. 
It was as if I could hear their voices. I, uh, it was as if I could hear voices I knew well, telling over and over again the wonder of that first night when the Savior was born. And say, several years later then, he wanted to write a hymn for the Sunday school children, which he loved. And uh, after he completed the words of uh, Old Little Town of Bethlehem, he gave the music or gave the words to Redner to put a tune to. Uh, and he really wanted him to have it easily singable for the children. But it took Redner, as good as a musician he was, he struggled with just coming up with the right melody for it. Uh, but it, again, as the story goes, Led, uh, Ledner, uh, on the night before Christmas Eve, uh, came up, woke up in the middle of the night, came up with the tune, wrote it down, and it's the same melody that we sing yet today. Uh, there's another uh, tune to it, actually. Robert, or Ralph uh, Vaughn Williams actually wrote a, another tune, which I, I don't think I've ever heard another tune for a little time in Bethlehem, but he wrote an alternative tune uh, for people in England, and, they, and apparently they liked it better. Uh, I didn't find that, but I, uh, but he also wrote about the uh, words that um, Brooks had come up with. And he said, not only does this hymn beautifully describe the little town asleep in, in the December night, it also gracefully modulates from a description of Christmas into, exa into an examination of the very meaning of Christmas. First in its encouragement of charity and faith, and then into the coming of Christ into the human heart. So with that, let's then sing Brooks's words and Redner's uh, tune to a little town of Bethlehem's 279. We'll sing all four verses. And again, listen for things that strike you or you find meaningful. 279.
things that struck you? Yeah? I always like the, the third line through the music, how it became kind of a minor poem and adds to the other. Each of the three, the, the, the third line in all of them. Yeah. Yep, yep, I know what you mean. Yep. So the music really entices us there and draws us in in a way. <laughs> like a lot of the hymns we hear, um, there's that light darkness theme that's going on there, right? I mean, you, we've uh, stressed that a lot in the last few weeks. In thy dark street shineth, even in the darkest valleys, right? What happens? There comes an everlasting light so that you know, we heard it in the John text that, you know, that the light overcomes the darkness and there's, the darkness can never overcome the light uh, in that. Other thoughts? I, 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 I love the image of, in, in, it's kind of into our silence, into the sleepiness of our lives, uh, God enters in. I mean, it, to me, it's it's into my own brokenness, into my own sinfulness, um, in, you know, in, in my drowsy state of life, God comes and brings the wondrous gift. Um, and even though we can't hear as well, God still comes and speaks a word of uh, comfort and peace and hope to us. And I think that comes through, in, at least in what I do. Did you also hear how personal some of this hymn was. I mean, it's very, God imparts to human hearts. I mean, uh, and descend, descend to us, we pray, abide with us, and abide, you know, make, make, let Christ make his home in our hearts, is the image that, that speaks there, and that fits with that whole Emmanuel theme that we heard in Matthew, that God is with us, that God dwells in us in Christ. Powerful things, there, yeah. I also think it's so wonderful uh, in you know winter time and in the tough times that we, you know, we've been living in this pandemic for the last couple of years, and unlike any other situation that we've been in for years and years. So it's really so reassuring and calming and um, hopeful. Hymns. Thanks for sharing in that today, and uh, with time being where it is, I, let's move to the responsive prayer, and then we've got one more uh, closing hymn. So let's stand and join together in the responsive prayer. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Blessed are you, Prince of Peace, you rule the earth with truth and justice. Send your gift of peace to all nations of the world. Blessed are you, Son of Mary, you shared our humanity. Have mercy on the sick, the dying, and all who suffer the same. Blessed are you, Son of God, you dwell among us as the Word made flesh. Reveal yourself to us in word and sacrament, that we may carry your light of life Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. You are the shepherds telling the story. We tell it in the streets and across the land. You are the wise ones worshiping with thanksgiving. We worship with gifts of song and service, talents and treasures. 
You are the angels announcing peace. We live with joy and no doubt in peace. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let's join in our closing carol. Uh, go tell them about 290.